And what's up? What's up? Welcome in GC Live. I am Wes Mitchell. He is Chris Clark. A Thursday episode of the show as we roll along on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. And uh, we are live with you today, uh, working through South Carolina's bye week and talking a bit about some big picture stuff with the season and uh, and South Carolina's two and three start, uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Today we're going to be joined by Eric Kimry, and then. A little bit later on, we joined by Perry Orff. So this is the quarterback episode of the show. EK, I can see you down there, man. Give me a thumbs up when you're ready to uh, to be brought on. He is good. We're going to try this again and see if uh, Chris Clark and Eric are able to talk or if it's just me and Eric. Uh, Eric, uh, how's it going, man? It's going good, guys. How are y'all? We, we are great. Uh, appreciate you taking the time. I know you got a lot going on. I know you're busy. Um, so what, let's get right down to it, man. So I, first of all, um, I know you got to tell everybody a little bit about the Fade In podcast because I got to say, man, the guests this year, um, they, they've always been good. But but this week, listening to you talk about, first of all, I didn't know you were a former third baseman. Um, and talking about facing off against Corey Jenkins, who – uh, I, I won't give away the story, but apparently Corey Jenkins in high school looked the exact same as he does right now physically, which is an absolute beast. So um, I think I think you owe it to yourself, man, to tell everybody about uh, your fade-in guest this week because I, I think it was a really good panel, man. Yeah, it was great to have Corey on. Uh, number one, Corey is just, just such a good person, and I've known him for a long, long time. And then to have Jonathan Martin and Adam Holmes on, so all three of us played together, and I, hopefully you could see that, you know, we had a little bit of a chemistry there. Uh, but, Corey, you're talking about an amazing story, one of the best uh, athletes, probably the best athlete to come out of Columbia, in my opinion. So, uh, yeah, it was great to have all three of those guys on. I haven't had any of them on before, and, um, and I think that I'll have to have them on in the future. And I'm really looking forward to this week. Uh, I got, I'm doing something a little bit different. So, you know, it being the bye week, we're going to – uh, I just want to get some ball storytellers on. And I couldn't think of any of them better than uh, my dad, Bill, uh, Brad Loyne, and Buddy Pugh. And so we're just going to get wow. together and sip on a couple beers, and I'm going to let them tell great football stories. And uh, it should be a lot of fun. It, I, man, with that group, I think you just sort of got to get out of the way, right? Like you just got to get them talking and uh, – and just get, and get them rolling and, and get out of the way, man. So that that'll be great. Obviously, y'all can find that uh, search on all the podcast platforms uh, for Fade In. You'll find it, and uh, it'll automatically download it to your phone each week if you subscribe to it. Um, so uh, let, let's talk a little ball, man. I, I know uh, y'all went into it on the, your pod as well, but uh, let's start big picture. Two and three start. Um, just what has stood out to you? Um, maybe. That, that sort of went as you expected or, or went against what you expected? Just big picture, what has stood out through these first five games at the midway point? Uh, I think you'd say, you know, if you said we were two and three, no one would be surprised. I, I think that looking back on it, the loss to Tennessee uh, stings the most, in my opinion, because that's the one that I think we could have won. And if we're sitting here at the break three and two, I think Game Cognition is probably feeling pretty good about itself. Um you know, I've been surprised that the defense hasn't been a little bit more potent, uh, to be honest. I thought it would be the strength of our team. And, and I think inversely, I'm surprised that the offense has been as good as it's been. So, you know, I'd say the defense has been kind of a C minus and the offense has been kind of a B minus. And I think going into the year, I probably would have predicted the opposite of that. EK, so before I ask my question, can you hear me, number one? Yeah. That's the most important thing. Wow. All right. We made we made a giant step forward. Appreciate your time, man. So I wanted to go with you on the offense. Obviously, offensive background for you as a coach, um, playing quarterback at high school level. Want to get your take on Mike Bobo, um, just what you've seen first five games, whether it's – you know, I know you knew some of what to expect schematically, but what have you seen from him schematically – what have you seen from him in terms of being able to squeeze production out of a group that, you know, had a lot of questions coming into this year? I mean, I think you judge a coach based on what he does with the talent that he has. And I, and I think that Mike Bobo has probably gotten the most out of this offense um, that he, that I could think of. So I've been super impressed. Um, I love his running game. You know, we run a lot of similar schemes at Hammond 
and uh, but he's got a lot of different types of runs that I think um, highlight the offensive line skill set and Kevin Harris and, and Fenwick's skill set. Um, and then, you know, I think we all, all know that right now the receiving room is the most problematic one on the team. And if you look at what he's done to, to kind of uh, combat that, you got Shai Smith, who's the one guy that's getting a lot of production. But your next three leading receivers are your two running backs and your tight end. And, I, and that's just the mark of a good coach. He's like, okay, this, these are the guys we've got to get the ball to. And he does that and he does it well. Uh, he also has a lot of play actions uh, that he's not afraid to call him first down um, that complement his running game. And, uh, and, and so I've been super impressed. I think that, in my opinion, the Mike Bobo hire has been the best hire of Will Muschamp's career. And, uh, and so hopefully he can, he can keep the offense being productive. Uh, don't get me wrong. We've got things we've got to work on for sure. But considering our personnel, it's, it's hard not to give Mike Bobo an A. I think it's – natural a lot of times people see um okay there, there are too many sacks and people blame the offensive line you know right off the bat uh, i think first of all offensive line in the running game has been really really good and, and given kevin harris given Deshaun fenwick room to operate and i've been really impressed with them uh pass pro has i mean there there have been some some times where maybe it leaves a little bit to desire but from what you've seen out of pass protection how much of it has been just O-line getting beat? How much of it is maybe a uh, quarterback needs to get it out a little bit quicker? Uh, I know sometimes it's a, a running back doesn't pick up somebody that's a, that's a free rusher or something like that. So it, it's never really, it seems like, one thing when it comes to pass protection. So well, just big picture, what have you seen uh, from the pass protection that you both like and, and you think maybe needs to improve? Yeah, I mean, I think the run game has been, has been the strength of the offensive line. Uh, overall, the pass pro has been – it's been good. That's it been great. There's been breakdowns at times. Usually that's an individual breakdown. But, guys, it's the SEC. You know, you're facing the best defensive lineman in the cosmos other than the NFL, right? So it's hard, and it's going to happen sometimes. And sometimes you get behind the sticks, and teams can kind of tee off a little bit on you, and uh, it makes it even harder. I think they're getting better. I think the pass pro is actually getting better. I, I know we had some sacks against LSU. I'd put more of those on um, – oh, I'd put the majority of those on either column or the receivers. And people forget sometimes that there's, you know, there's coverage sacks or maybe a receiver ran a wrong route, which I think we heard happen this past week. Or the quarterback just got to get rid of the ball. And you also don't have a guy that's, you know, going to extend plays with his athleticism. You know, no offense to Colin, that's not his skill set. And so a, a lot of times a really good athletic quarterback can make an offensive line look better than they are. So, um, you know, I think the offensive line's been steady this year, been, been, been good, better than good. And uh, I look forward to them having an even better back half of the season. Quarterback, since you mentioned Colin Hill, that, that's another area I want to get your take on with, you know, since the first half of the season here, just assessing quarterback play. We, we all sort of knew the book on Colin coming in. Like you said, mobility is not going to be a strong suit. And for the most part, I think we've seen a lot of what we thought play out, right? We've seen managing the offense getting them into the right run look. So in your mind, from what you've seen for South Carolina, in your mind as a coach, your perspective, you know, how do you balance, hey, should should they be pushing the ball downfield more, even if it's the, at the expense of making more mistakes? Um, do you play somebody else who's a little bit more mobile, get Doty in more for his legs? Um, just what is your take on how Collins played overall and then sort of those trade-offs that you make, how important each of those aspects are with getting into the right run looks versus what you see in the past game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, listen, first and foremost, if you can't do it up top mentally, you can't play quarterback. And if you can't throw the ball accurately, you, play, you can't play quarterback. So I love, I know that everybody, like the sexy thing to do is to say, oh, what the guy runs a 4-3, let's put him in the game. Well, if he throws it to the other team or he doesn't know what he's doing, it doesn't matter, okay? Um, and so – I think that you got to start with a guy that understands the offense, that can get you out of bad plays and throws the ball accurately. Colin's done that for the most part. I think he's been really steady. You know, we know, we kind of know who he is. If he's got to pull the ball down, you know, good things don't happen for the most part. He's not going to be able to, a guy that relies on extending the plays. He's going to have to be a distributor of the football and that's who he is. And, and I think if somebody was in position to, give us a better chance to score more points that you would see them on the field. And I think right now, Colin Hill is the guy um, that, that gives us the best chance to move the football. And so, you know, there's, he's had his plays here and there, but for the most part, I think he's been pretty steady. 
we uh we, we talked to Perry and we're gonna play that interview a little bit later on. And we sort of talked about that fine line when you know you're in the middle of a play and there's that snap decision. Um, am I releasing this football? Am I going to just take the sack? Am I going to try to get out of here? And how, you know, it, it's very easy after the fact to pause the screen and say, well, that guy, that guy was open. And maybe he wasn't even open in the split second that the quarterback had to actually make, you know, the decision. So how, how mm-hmm. fine is that line between making the decision of, is it worth it to try to put the ball in this window or not? And yeah. I don't know, you know, I, I don't know if you can like, even appreciate probably how quick that decision has to take place uh, yeah. because 99% of us have never actually done it. Yeah. You're talking about, you know, you're, you're, you're using, you know, your brain to process information and in some type of quick vision or, or really a, a photograph in your head. I always looked at it like the strobe light. You get a quick flash and then it's darkness and a quick flash and you've got to make a decision based on that really, really quickly. And, uh, and so I think the guys that can process that quicker probably make decisions faster. And But but then what do you do when that breaks down a little bit? Well, that just kind of depends on who you are. And I think for, for Colin, he's probably looking for the next check down. And then maybe, you know, lastly, I'm going to try to throw the ball away or pull it down. A guy like Bo Nix, you know, that internal clock lasts about a second and a half, and he's going to pull it down. That's probably what he's done his whole life. Uh, and so it depends on your offense on which one helps you more. Um, but it is, it's a, certainly a, a decision that happens in like nanoseconds. All right, EK. So defensively, obviously, as you said earlier, and I agree with you, the bi- the biggest issue on this team has been defense, which we did not anticipate. Mm-hmm. What's been the biggest problem? In my mind, it's been the inability to stop the run, especially on early downs. It's gotten USC behind the sticks up until LSU, they were pretty good on third. They were really good on third down somehow. And I think the the run game issues really manifested themselves even more in the LSU game. What's been the biggest issue? If it is the run, why? And can it get better? Yeah, I mean, it better get better. Or, you know, you're not going to have anybody looking at your website anymore. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no, uh, yeah, I've been disappointed in the run defense for sure. And I, I do think that it's been particularly on uh, first down defense as a whole to where we're either in really kind of softer man free coverage or we're giving up seven yards, eight yard clip runs to where, you know, offenses are able to play ahead of the sticks. And so uh, I didn't anticipate our defense struggling the way that they have. I think we, we've got to do something to be more disruptive up front to create some penetration whether it be in the run game or the pass game to get pressure on quarterbacks to try to get people in the second and longs or maybe third and longs to where now you can pin your ears back a little bit and go, go get the quarterback and get, apply pressure even with a four man rush. Cause on third and 10, you know, they're probably going to throw the ball. Uh, but yeah, we just, we have not been able to do that. We've got, we got whipped up front against LSU. I'll just give LSU credit that they had a big offensive line. that was better than I thought they were going to be. And sometimes they just kind of manhandled us, but we got to find some ways to disrupt Maybe take some chances on first and second down, bring some blitzes or some stunts uh, that you, you may may catch you, but you may catch them too. And so I, I'd love to see us, you know, take take some more chances. All right, so we, we are at the midway point. Uh, final thing I sort of have here. Um, w- what are your expectations for these final five games? I mean, I look at it, it it's going to be similar in that you're going to go into all these games and say if, if Carolina plays well, they'll have a chance to win in the fourth quarter. And if they make a bunch of mistakes like they did, you know, this past Saturday, they could they could get whipped. So um, what's sort of your expectation for these final five and what needs to happen um, for Carolina moving forward? Yeah, I mean, I'm kind of with you there, Wes. I really don't know what to expect. I, I thought thought we had some momentum after the Auburn game. and I thought we saw this defense was going to start to come into its own. And that just wasn't the case. Um, and so I, I think you're going to get a more of the same right now. Uh, but the question for this team and for this coaching staff is going to be, where do they go from here? You know, last year you beat Georgia and Georgia and you have some of that momentum I'm talking about. And then, you know, you lose to Florida. And you gave them a fight for a little while then you lose to them. And then really the wheels came off. You know, a lot of guys started getting hurt. And then, you know, you get all this negative momentum and we found ourselves in a pretty bad place. Well, let's make sure that doesn't happen, right? And the best way to do that is to win some games and, and win a few in a row. 
And I think if they can do that, they could, you know, have a really positive second half of the season. Um, and so that Texas A&M game is pretty critical to me, uh, even if you don't win it, but you're competitive. And I think, though, if Texas A&M comes into Columbia and wipes the floor with the Gamecocks, you could have some really negative momentum that could translate into some of these other games, which are even, you know, maybe more winnable. Uh, mm-hmm. and so I, I think we've got to find a way to win, win one of those games you're not supposed to win again in the back half, I mean, then take care of business in the games that you know you can win. And so I'm hopeful, hopeful that'll happen. I think we got to adjust a few things in order to do that. Um, but here, we'll see, I guess. Yeah, anything else, Chris? No, I'm good, man. Appreciate it. Yeah, hey, we, we appreciate All the right, time, man. man. Well, why don't, uh, real quick, why don't you tell them about the Patreon and, and some of the stuff you got going on on there? Yeah, um, started a Patreon site. And I, I got some extra content from Fade In. And um, so got some great stories from Corey Jenkins this past week about playing in the big leagues against Pedro Martinez and Randy Johnson. I also have a friend of mine that's a really funny guy named Russ Webb that we've had a couple conversations. And then I do my own podcast called The Clinic, where I get into more of a deeper kind of schematic assessment of what's going on. And you can enter, en- engage with me on Patreon. We have a, a group chat with a few people that are on the higher tier. Uh, that's been a lot of fun, and we do some Zoom calls here and there. So uh, check it out, Patreon Fade End Productions. Yeah, R- Russ is freaking hilarious. Uh, that was my first time meeting him a couple weeks ago. Right. Had no idea. Nobody warned me what to expect. This guy is off the charts funny, so you, everybody will have to check that out. Uh, that is Eric Kimry, Coach, we appreciate it, man. Thanks, man. Thanks, guys. Take care. Yep, have a good one. Uh, good stuff there. And – Obviously, Chris, I think we're all sort of um, we're all sort of on the same page here, man. And that um, lots, I think it's one of those things. If you start to go into the fan base, uh, by the way, what's up? I see everybody in the chat there. I don't think I've said hello yet. So, what's up, everybody? Appreciate y'all joining us. Um, we we sort of went straight to EK there. This is, of course, uh, this show is brought to you by AffordableMedicalUSA.com, home of the game day chair. I want to get that out of the way and, and tell you about those guys. But, man, so there's a little bit of discussion, I would say, about the quarterback position. I, You know, you and I talked off air. I think we probably even talked on air. I don't really think that's a, an actual discussion right now, personally, within the program. Um, and so point being, when you talk to people – uh, you know, when we talk to former players, former coaches, um, or, or current coaches, I should say, um, the sense is we all sort of kind of identify what the problem is for the most part. I mean, I think everybody is sort of in agreement the run defense has got to get better. Now, you know, some different people are going to disagree on quarterback. That That's – and I think we hit on it there with EK, that, that position – there's such a, just a fine line between what people consider good quarterback play and not, and you can almost never do enough because we have replays now. Everything's on TV where, uh, you know, you're going to go – the plays get put on Twitter after the fact. Uh, people pause it, and they, you know, oh, you, you didn't make that split-second decision to throw to that guy. So quarterback play will always be discussed. But for the most part, if you look at this team and the issues – we're all sort of in agreement that the defense, particularly the run defense, but I'll just say the defense in general has got to be better. Yeah. I I mean, I think that's what the biggest issues stem from, right. Is, is defensively, especially when you view it through the lens of like what was expected and what was needed going into this season. You know, we, we knew coming into this year, new offensive coordinator, Mike Bobo. And we knew that barring some huge surprise, it wouldn't be the offense that would carry this team or that would need to carry this team. And as prob- the, the hope for South Carolina offensively needed to be that they could run the ball better. And they have. It's looked different than we've thought, right? You know, but that they needed to run the ball well. They need to be able to stay on the field more. They need to be more consistently productive. And we knew they'd have big problems at receiver, you know, that would be a question. But for the most part, as EK agreed, Mike Bobo has been a bright spot and he's squeezed out enough for this team to put forth winning efforts for the most part. It's been the defense. We also knew going in, Hey, the defense is going to have to be good. We, we all thought, or speaking for myself and I know you, I think you agree Wes. you know, the defense had to be 
the strength of this team. It has not been. It has been the biggest letdown. And the biggest issues that are easy to identify, not stopping the run, too many explosive plays. And uh, and that's been the bottom line. Sometimes they've, you know, they, they've been there, but they aren't as noticeable because of who you're playing, like Vanderbilt. Sometimes they've been there or they get sort of um, countered by mistakes, Auburn. Sometimes they've only been there at times on a certain drive against Tennessee. And then sometimes they've been there the whole game, LSU. You know, So um, th- those are the things that, you know, I, I, I do think there are some deficiencies on the team that we knew, you know, that you felt like maybe they could mask. I do feel like they've got better players than what has shown so far. Um, so the key for this team and a turnaround for the second half defensively is can they do some things differently? Can they adjust? Can they play better? Whatever combination that may be. Um, had a question on here by Craig, one of our loyal uh, listeners and watchers. He said he heard on the radio this morning uh, someone say the quarterback competition wasn't even really that close with Helensky and Hill. Is that what you all have heard as well? I, you know, I actually tend to, to agree with the the notion, Chris, that the original competition. Now, now it's, it's all relative. You know what what is close? Um, you know, it's like they obviously wanted to let these guys have every chance to battle it out to start. Um, so it was close in a sense of they didn't just say week one of camp. Hill's the guy, you know, give him all the first team reps. You know, it, it wasn't one of those situations. But I would say as far as the actual final decision, without seeing, and I, I know Bobo charted everything. Yeah. Without us being able to actually see those charts and see the numbers and see the completions, um, I never got the impression that it was quite as close as maybe – um, it, it was led on to be, and I, I say that because I felt like we sort of were able to call it throughout that that Hill w- was ultimately going to win this, and it was because of um, the understanding of where the football is supposed to go within this offense. And uh, pe- people don't, for whatever reason, people do not like that answer, that whole he knows the offense. And, Chris, I kind of think, it's he knows the offense is an easy way to say something that is far more complicated, which is he doesn't just know the offense, but he knows where the football is supposed to be and can process that quickly within a game of having 300 pound dudes running at you. It's one thing to know the offense, like, oh, I can tell you what, what this play is. It's something else to have some experience actually going out there and doing it and executing it. Yeah, you're right. I mean, and, and a lot of people took the, you know, Colin Hill knowing the offense better, and that's a prime, primary reason why he's winning the job is some negative. Well, that means he doesn't, he can't throw the ball. No, I mean, you, you have to be able to operate. You have to know, EK said it himself, you have to know where to go with the football or it doesn't really matter, you know, about – well, how big of an arm do you have? How willing are you to push it downfield? How much? How can you run? How much can you run around? What do you like in the pocket? You do have to know what to do with the ball. And so, you know, a lot of people took the experience thing to say that that was literally the only factor. He was more productive in preseason too, in practice. I mean, obviously, if you've got a quarterback battle, if you're opening it up, if you're having a competition, you're going to want to chart how productive a guy is, not just. Mm-hmm. You can also know the offense, and if you're out there throwing picks left and right, if you're not moving the ball when you're out there with the first team, they're probably not going to play, right? So um, I think some people are having a hard time reconciling the fact that Colin Hill could be the best option because they look at it and say, well, he could be playing better. Sure. Um, That does not automatically mean that Ryan Helensky, just because he was a highly rated guy, is the better option. I understand the backup quarterback is always the most popular guy. Uh, Ryan Holinsky had a lot of talent coming out of high school. He's shown flashes of that even here. So we, we know that, but there's a lot of things that go into it. The run looks, I mean, are huge South Carolina. The, the, the only thing this entire team has done well consistently is run the ball. Do we really, 
do people really want to take that away? Because that's a huge aspect. You know, Colin gets them in a lot of right looks against the run that maybe if you don't change the play, maybe you're a three yard loss. You know, I mean, I don't know how many, what percentage wise those are, but, um, you know, it's certainly a part of it. And I think, you know, I understand people wanting to push the ball down the field more. We, we knew it'd be an issue with this team, no matter who was playing quarterback, really. But you'd also have to think about, you know, a lot of people say, well, put Ryan in, he's a gunslinger. That's fine, but is it going to be – a legitimate question is, would it be the gunslinging that we saw at the end of the year last year? That didn't work out too well, did it? I mean, and, and they still got receiver problems. I'm not saying it would, but it's a legitimate question, right? Well, everybody wants a gunslinger until they throw an interception by gunslinging, and then everybody turns on the gunslinger as well. So everybody in, in yeah. Yeah. everybody in theory likes the idea, um, but there, there's a constant battle between should I throw this football or not? You know, is that window is that window big enough for me to throw the football? So um, all right, we're we're gonna go to Perry Orth here shortly. And but I do want to hit this question first, and then we'll talk about the game day chair. Um, Tyrion Ingram Dawkins making his announcement tomorrow. Uh, we'll of course um, continue to update everybody on Gamecock Central on that. We're continuing to, um, I would say, gather information because the information on these, even if the even if the decision is made, one thing we've learned from following recruiting for a long, long time is that the information can change, leading into uh, a big decision like this, what people are getting told, you know, can can change. I I think safe to say, Georgia and South Carolina are the two uh, major contenders here. Um, whether it ends up being Georgia or South Carolina, Chris, you had an update. Uh, was that yesterday or the day before? Um, not sure on our insiders forum. The day it had to be at least the day before, but the days are going by so fast that it could have been like three weeks ago for all I know. Yeah, it runs together. We will continue to update people yep. on the insider forum. Um, what, where, where's your feel right now, man? And, and we will, I will say that, um, I don't think we're going to lock in anything right now. I mean, I, I, I put in, I put in my prediction for South Carolina and Ingram Dawkins. I mean, like, Maybe in January. I mean, it, it's been like a long time ago, and I have not changed it because I always thought he was a South Carolina guy. Like I just had a feeling um, that's where he would ultimately end up. But uh, Georgia's done an excellent job recruiting him. There's no doubt about that. Uh, good, good relationships over there. As Russ said, Georgia is gaining smoke. That, that's absolutely true. I mean, you if if you follow just the the internet buzz right now. You'd probably say Georgia if you're just following it from that like that perspective. But what we try to do is dig a little bit deeper because the internet buzz does not always equal where somebody actually commits to. Sometimes it does, um, but Tyron Ingram Dawkins is a guy who has really, I would say, at one point or another, has been a lean to at least three of these schools, being South Carolina, Georgia, and Tennessee, Chris been very difficult to tell i think that is the thing that we know right now is because tennessee made a change on the defensive line in the midst of the season second d-line coaching change they've had in less than a year you know since in this calendar year rather um that pushed them back and so georgia and south carolina now i'll also say this behind the scenes man you know this there's some very legitimate reasons to feel like either school could get him. And this happens sometimes, you know, sometimes we even hear very specifically what was said, who it was said to, when it was said, and it makes it hard, you know, and so that from there it's sorting out what's real, what's not. Every now and then there's some decisions where we go in and say, you know what, we don't know. More, more often than not, you tend to have a good feel, you know. Um, I don't know yet if we'll know for sure on this one. And, and I'd add, Regardless of what happens on Friday, this one's going to keep going. I know Tennessee is going to keep recruiting him. Georgia is, South Carolina is, no matter which school he he ultimately commits to. But I'm hoping, hoping that we're going to have a better field tonight, you know, with the decision 24 hours away, maybe a little more, maybe a little less, that we'll be able to wrangle some more information tonight. We, we've been doing that today. 
we just don't have the most that we've come up now with now still makes it a little bit cloudy for us, I would say. Yep. So um, hopefully everybody on here is a Gamecock Central subscriber anyway. We'll certainly post on there. If we have anything, if we find anything out, uh, we'll have some type of update, hopefully uh, tonight or tomorrow morning, uh, depending on what information we're able to get. Uh, Chris, uh, you want to tell everybody about the game day chair, then we're going to go out to uh, Perry Orth uh, on our QB episode here at the midway point of the 2020 football season. Yeah, so the game day chair from Affordable Medical Equipment. Make sure you check those guys out, affordablemedicalusa.com. They got a nifty little search bar. Check out the Maxi Comfort Cloud with Twilight. That is the technical name for the game day chair. Um, we're actually working on an even easier way to get you links and a, and, a, and a website to get there. But check out the link in the YouTube video description. Go to GamecockCentral.com. You can find the link there, or you can search for it directly on the site. Or pick up the phone, call 803-926-1493. Ask them about the game day chair. Um, super comfortable, roomy, multiple different positions, TV watching, lounge, twilight, which is the lay flat, zero gravity, at the push of a button. Super comfortable recliner that you can watch. All your sports, Netflix, whatever you want. And so make sure you check those guys out. And those guys make this show possible, which is uh, frankly awesome for us. So, uh, and for you, I hope you, I hope you feel that way. Um, all right. So we're going to go out now. Perry Orth, as y'all know by now, it's a little bit clunky how I have to bring in this interview was from like an hour ago. So still fresh, a little bit clunky how I have to bring in the outside interviews. But I promise the audio, I think, will work. The first time around this time, unlike last time. But um, here is former Gamecock quarterback Perry Orth uh, talking similar stuff to, to what EK was talking about, but some good stuff, I think, from Perry. So we'll go to that right now. And as promised, we'll bring him in right now. It is former Gamecock Perry Orth, a uh, busy man. Perry, I, uh, dude, I, I see you out there at the QB1 stuff. Obviously, you got your stuff going on at um, AC Flora. I see you sneaking in a workout at our gym there. And I got to say, man, I figured this is the, the uh, perfect day. I'm going to bust out my uh, my QB1 hat. There you go. I like it. <laughs> perfect timing. I love for, it. For the interview, man. So, uh, yeah, keep, uh, you know, just update everybody. Tell them all about what you got going on. I know it's sort of nonstop for you, but, uh, you know, just give everybody a little background on what you've been up to, man. Yeah, no, so I'm still selling insurance, IMG. Now it's Brown and Brown. Um, been doing that for three years, almost to the day. November 1st will be my three-year anniversary, which I'm pretty excited about. Um, but yeah, QB1's been uh, doing extremely well, um, you know, training kids from all over the place and then ultimately trying to get them off to college. Um, the kid that I've trained for three years or I guess four years now, which is crazy to think about, um, I actually coach him at AC floor. He just picked up a Presbyterian offer, PC offered him. Um, yesterday, which is a big deal for a 5'9", 5'10 quarterback to get a D1 offer. He's got all the ability in the world. So this week's been great. Um, AC Flora, we just got ranked number one in the state in 4A um, by multiple polls. So we've got a good team. This fall's been a little different, but now it's starting to get back to normal um, and hope hope we can continue that. And then, yeah, just try to try to squeeze in a workout whenever I can. <laughs> yeah, it sounds, uh, sounds busy, but fun, man. Um, I don't know if you saw it. We actually caught up with Matulis yesterday, Mike Matulis. Oh, nice. Yeah. yeah, so he's – dude, he is in incredible shape now, and he's yep. he's got a big fight um, on uh, on Saturday. I Man, yep. I'm I'm looking at this guy. I don't know anything about boxing, but just knowing what I know about Matulis, I wouldn't – I would not want to step in the ring with that guy. No, his, his reach alone, and just I know how his tenacity was when we played ball together. Uh, that's not a guy that I'm I'm going to try to pick a fight with, but um, yeah, I'm I'm excited. I actually was planning on going to his fight, um, but um, my girlfriend and I had had made plans previously, so I can't break oh, those. Wow. <laughs> you, you are you are a busy man, dude. You got uh, the girlfriend responsibilities as well. So oh yeah, you, you got to balance it all. I know. Um, among all that, you've been watching Carolina, two yeah. and three start. Um, yep. Kind of, I mean, I would say, dude, with this all SEC schedule, um, I at least expected there were going to be some some ups and downs in this season. You, you come off the obviously a win everybody's kind of excited about with Auburn, then 
really just go to LSU, way too many mistakes, don't, you know, don't play well down there. What have been sort of your big picture thoughts before we get into some details just on the season so far, um, you know, from a coach and, and quarterback sort of mindset with you? Yeah, I mean, we're probably right in line with where a lot of people probably thought. Um, the Tennessee game was a toss-up. Florida game was a toss-up. Probably looked like a loss preseason. Um, Vanderbilt win. Auburn probably would you, you would say a loss preseason, but we played extremely well defense, and obviously J.C. Horn had an incredible day. Um, LSU, I thought we were going to play them better, regardless of the quarterback being in or out. Or we, I, I just figured that we'd play them a little bit tougher, but they obviously figured something out throughout their their bye week um getting ready for our game um I wouldn't say that we look any different than we have I mean we have good players um it's just a lot of these games in this conference of where we're at are going to be decided by one possession or, or less you know that's why I was saying Saturday was kind of the outlier in my opinion mm. um because uh because of what was going on with you know, the score ultimately, but then when you, uh, you know, when you see just kind of the way that, that we've, we've played through the first four games, I just, I wasn't expecting that ultimately. Um, I'd like to see a little bit more, um, you know, down the field passing game, but with that being said, it, we, we don't have the guys out wide to make it happen mm. right now. Um, Shai Smith has played really well, but, um, Besides that, we haven't had anybody else step up. You know, without without that downfield game, it's forced us to run it, which we've done really well. But ultimately, um, you know, we're gonna we're, we're gonna you have to throw the football vertically to win games. And I've really liked Colin Hill. I think the offensive line has has played better each game. Honestly, um, in in the play calling has been we've been very well balanced on offense. Um, we just still defensively. We don't pressure the quarterback all that well. Got some guys in the secondary, but we it just it still just kind of looks the same. Which, um, frankly, for me, has kind of been a little bit of a surprise. I, I think, as a whole, I I expected a little more. Honestly, if, if we're talking big picture, man, I expected a little more out of this defense coming into the year, and and the offense has actually, considering all the questions preseason, kind of exceeded my expectations. I would say overall through the first five games. Uh, but man, with, so with LSU, I, I think uh, I've made the point whenever you give up a pick six and you give up a kickoff return for a touchdown in the same game, if, if you're playing good people, if you're playing up, you know, against a pretty talented team, uh, it, it's just so hard to, to win games with those type of game changing plays against you. But, yeah. you know, from, from a perspective of play calling and playing the quarterback position, um, how hard is it to win a game when you're sort of – I mean, after the kickoff return for touchdown, you're down three scores. You're starting to get to that point where you're at the midway point of the third quarter and you're a run-first team. It sort of completely takes you out of what you do well, I feel like. Yeah, you're exactly right. And that's why I I, uh, I was – I wouldn't say I was sitting there screaming into the mic, but I was definitely, you know, getting semi-emotional about, you know, people asking for the quarterback to be benched Well when you, you give up a pick six, which really wasn't the quarterback's fault. The receiver was running on a little five yard in route, to stop his route. I mean, and, and you talk to any, anybody around the program, they'll tell you that. And it could have been just cause he's new and didn't know exactly what to do there, but you take that and then you get the kickoff return for a touchdown. You're down three scores midway through the third quarter. You, you take yourself right out of your game plan. You take yourself right out of who you are. And when that happens, you, you know, you're fighting an uphill battle. We're just not built for that. Um, and then ultimately our defense could not, they couldn't stop them. I mean, it, it, they, I've been hearing for years since before I got to Carolina, if you want to win on the road in this conference, you got to bring your defense. If you don't bring your defense, you're not going to win. Very, very little teams. You still there? Yeah. Oh, I mean, freaking fun is blown up. Um, very little teams win shootout games on the road in the Southeastern Conference. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it is what it is. I mean, we uh, 
we just haven't we we're not built to sustain that kind of a game we're not built for that game even if we're at home and then you spot them 14 points with the pick six and the special teams touchdown um it's just tough to win that way and that's why i was saying that game's kind of the outlier of the first four right and um so as far as this offense goes i think you can very accurately say that in a general sense Mike Bobo has taken the parts he has to work with, I think, and tried to sort of um, focus on what he does well, has done a good job of uh, obviously trying to get Shy Smith involved. They found a guy they can run the football with in Kevin Harris, which I think maybe was a surprise just how big he has been. But, but when you look yeah. sort of at the details of the scheme and exactly what they're doing differently, what, what have you seen from Bobo's approach um, you know, compared to sort of what, what you ran with Roper and then BMAC yeah. the last couple of years? Well, yeah, they, um, they're they extremely balanced in the run game. And th- what I mean by that is that they, they run a lot of different looks. They run power. Um, they, they run some dive. Uh, they have a fullback every once in a while. A um, few toss sweeps. We haven't seen that in a long time. Um, so there's a lot of different things they do. I think our offensive line run blocks really well. Um, and then Kevin Harris, he, he doesn't go down on the first tackle, on the first defender. So um, all in all, I mean, the run game has been great. And efficient, you know, efficiency-wise through the pass game, we've been okay. It hasn't been bad. Um, you know, we had our case of the drops against Florida. But besides that, we really haven't, um, you know, we really haven't seen too much more out of the receivers. You know, look at the Vanderbilt game. Um, and we ran the ball all over them. And, and we didn't really – have to push the push the ball vertically on them um same thing versus Auburn we got three turnovers in that game I think all of them on the plus side of the field um you look at that not really having to 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 stretch defenses when you do that LSU is a little different because we had to fight uphill battle but you know with the the secondary that LSU has and the talent they have and our talent at receiver you know if they are locking up man-to-man are playing really good zone defense you know you you look at the game and say well Colin Hill held on to the ball too long well probably but you know where the guys covered what was going on downfield quarterbacks are going to miss reads and miss guys open all the time during the course of the game receivers I can't tell you how many times I've watched football receivers will be streaking down the field All right. Hey, guys. Apparently, we have lost Wes, and the interview was on Wes's computer. Obviously, he had pre-recorded that interview a little while ago, and uh, it froze up. And so, as you said, RJ, a little bit of technical difficulties there. So, I've actually, uh, Wes and I, every now and then, will step out, get up for just a moment when the interview is playing. So, I was here, noticed it. And so we will get Wes back as soon as we can, and we'll get the rest of the interview played as soon as we can get him back. Wes just let me know that they're having some internet connection problems. So I think we do have, if we can get Wes back, we've got a few more minutes left on that Perry interview. Then obviously we had some stuff we wanted to talk about to wrap up the show. But uh, if you guys have any questions um, based on anything Perry said, anything EK said, anything you want me to answer, or anything you just want to discuss in the comments, let's do it. Obviously, um, up until that time, and appreciate the uh, kind words there, Russ. Definitely some good stuff from Perry, some good stuff from EK. You know, I always like getting the perspective of these former quarterbacks because, you know, as a quarterback, they know a lot about the defense. You know, as a quarterback, you're studying defenses very, very well, the entire picture, right? Not just 
the secondary, but the front seven, the back seven, you know, you're looking at it in so many different ways. And also, obviously, they're going to be able to talk schematically and things of that nature. So uh, question from BHAM GC, Chris, what is Rick Sandage's situation? So, yeah, Rick's snaps have been, for anybody following our snap count features that we put out pretty much every Monday after the game, you're going to notice that uh, Rick Sandage's snaps have been pretty low. I think he played one snap in one game. And uh, I think they've been in single digits pretty much the entire uh, season. So obviously he's, he's a guy that has talent. Um, we knew that, you know, coming out of high school, this is a guy that was, I think, a top 40 prospect. He's shown some flashes, he showed some flashes in high school. He showed some flashes from the early time tenure of his career at South Carolina. But I think the issue there is the word that we talk about a lot. Um, and that is consistency. Word of the off season, like Wes has said, or word of the season too, since we've got into it. Um, and I know it's it's been very difficult, I think, for people to look at it and say, what's one of the biggest issues on this defense? It has been the defensive line, right? It's been stopping the run. Why isn't Rick Sandage in his junior year, um, who's a big guy, who has talent, who is highly regarded, why is he not playing more? And that can be difficult to sort of reconcile in the mind about why he's not playing, but um, he's not been as consistent, you know, in his performance. A lot of it, you know, you got to – you got to look at what's happening in practice. So he still does have talent. I wouldn't give up on it either this season or for the future, uh, but he's got to get more consistent. Um, he's got to be better because he does have talent. Two Wes, are we back? Uh, the receivers, you're looking at the yes, I think we are. I added you without your permission, but I, I didn't know if there was something on, on your end to where you were like locked out or something. No, I'm, I'm in. This is weird. We just did the flip. On the screen yeah, again. again. Yeah, I'm in control. Uh, yeah, you have. Uh, you're the captain now. I'm I guess. Um, all right. Yeah, my internet. I don't know if it's this wind or or what happened, but my internet completely went out. Uh, which luckily, I'm actually impressed. Uh, it cut off the interview, but the stream kept going. I, I guess. So uh, uh, that's cool. Let's see. It's two forty nine. I can yeah. put y'all. Y'all want to hear the rest of the Perry interview, um, and then I'll, I'll put it. I'll actually post. I'll post the entire Perry interview, just as a video. Um, you know, not like a stream, just a, a regular old video on our YouTube as well. But uh, let me see. Wes, can, while you're doing, while you're queuing that up, can I hit a couple of these questions real quick? Because I wanted to make sure. That yeah, I yeah, yeah. Hit them. Um, I tell you what. You hit the questions, and then you can lead. You can lead right into the Perry video, and I'll uh, whenever you give me a cue, I'll uh, I'll hit play on it. Yeah, sounds good. So a couple things. Number one, I'm gonna do them in reverse order. Allen Hopkins, Mike Bobo is told by Georgia to find a place to go. Colorado State fired him. So how could how good could he be? Well, a couple of things there. Um, I, I don't know for sure that that's true on Mike Bobo in Georgia. Uh, he he got a head coaching job at Colorado State. As we know, uh, head coach and coordinators, different different role. There are guys who've been uh, subpar coordinators or haven't even been coordinators at all that have gone on to be really great head coaches. There have been guys who have been outstanding as coordinators who have not been good head coaches. And so uh, Mike Bobo's tenure did not work out at Colorado State, but his offenses were good there. He was still in control. Uh, and his offenses at Georgia were obviously very good too. A lot of people at Georgia would love to have him back. He's done a good job with what he's had to work with at South Carolina. Uh, he did a good job with his offenses at Colorado State and at Georgia. So the answer is still, uh, Alan, that he he is still good. He's a very highly regarded coordinator, and he has a really, really good track record if you dig into what his offenses have actually done. He's not the head coach at South Carolina. He's the coordinator, and, and he's got a good track record there. One other thing James Robinson mentioned about the Muschamp article it didn't re address – the uh, takeaway anomalies that happened in Muschamp's best year, nine win season. Yeah, that that was a huge aspect of it. Something that uh, we've talked about a lot. You know, I didn't address how anybody got to each point. Um, and so, what I mean by that is, I talked about top twenty five wins, but I didn't talk about say strength of schedule. You know, if you have a strength of schedule, say a team plays the hardest strength of schedule in the country and they win eight games. And then say a team plays the 
110th hardest schedule in the country and they win 10, you know, so I didn't account for those types of things. Um, you know, both, I think Spurrier actually played more postseason top 25 teams. Um, I think he was three and 16, Muschamp was three and 14, something like that. So I didn't address those. Also didn't address, um, like in the four win season for uh, Muschamp, I didn't mention that they lost the senior quarterback for 11 of the 12 games, that almost the entire team was injured, things like that. I didn't go into any of that. I just looked at raw data. I didn't go back to Spurrier and litigate why each season happened. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you could certainly get into all of that type of stuff about why things happen. Um, there's so many statistical measures that you could use. Um, and as a lot of people have rightfully pointed out, you know, Steve Spurrier didn't have a losing record at South Carolina at all, unless you count the 2015 year where he walked out midseason. Or if you, um, you know, and Muschamp's had two, uh, you know, had a six win season, six and seven, and then four and eight. But just bringing a couple other, um, you know, statistical little analysis into that story. So, yeah, we didn't, we didn't dive into the how each coach got there or, or why. It was just more of a look at a few different statistics. So I hope, hope, that, uh, hope that answers. Yeah, so now we are going to finish up. I think we still got Wes, which means we still have the rest of the Perry Orth interview. So let's uh, let's go ahead and roll that there, Wesley. Um, so there's a lot of different things they do. I think our offensive line run blocks really well. Um, and then Kevin Harris, he, he doesn't go down on the first tackle, on the first defender. So um, all in all, I mean, the run game has been great. And efficient, you know, efficiency-wise through the pass game, we've been okay. It hasn't been bad. Um, you know, we had our case of the drops against Florida, but besides that, we really haven't, um, you know, we really haven't seen too much more out of the receivers. You know, look at the Vanderbilt game, um, and we ran the ball all over them, and, and we didn't really have to push the push the ball vertically on them. Um, same thing versus Auburn. We got three turnovers in that game. I think all of them on the plus side of the field. Um, you look at that, not really having to – to, to, to stretch defenses when you do that. LSU is a little different because we had to fight uphill battle. But, you know, with the, the secondary that LSU has and the talent they have and our talent at receiver, you know, if they are locking up man-to-man or playing really good zone defense, you know, you, you look at the game and say, well, Colin Hill held on to the ball too long. Well, probably. But, you know, where the guys covered, what was going on downfield, quarterbacks are going to miss reads and miss guys open all the time during the course of a game. Receivers, I can't tell you how many times I've watched football. Receivers will be streaking down the field wide open. The quarterback's looking on the other side of the field. Well, of course he doesn't see him. He, mm-hmm. That guy's not misreading. The defense, the, the defense just let the guy let him free for whatever reason. Or, you know, you'll turn and throw a ball, say, on an out route, and the safety will run down after the ball's gone and the receiver's right there, quote, unquote, wide open. They're like, oh, what's he doing there? Well, if you look and pause the tape, right when the quarterback goes to release the ball, the safety actually is right there. But now you're looking after the fact, after he's run over to where the ball is going. So I know, you know, you can say I'm making excuses for the quarterback, but uh, that's just the reality of it. And I don't think it's time for a quarterback change. I don't, I think that's a bit premature. I think that, um, you know, you, 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 if, if, if Colin Hill goes out and struggles again, you know, against Texas A&M, then, then, then you should start having that conversation. But these guys should be competing every day in practice. And if the coaches feel that Ryan or Luke is, is giving him enough competition where they feel that they would be comfortable enough to put, you know, one of those guys in over Colin and still have a great chance to win the game, they'll do it. They, I mean, he's proven that he's had no hesitation with doing that. Um, so we'll see. Where sort of is that? I, I would think it's a fine line playing quarterback uh, between forcing the ball into a tight window and sort of giving yourself a chance to to make a big play versus not. Um, I feel like it's kind of one of those things that the second a quarterback makes a, an ill advised throw, um, you're going to, people are going to jump on him. Why'd you throw that ball? You know, you can't put the ball in danger. But then, at the same time, maybe somebody sees on the replay, oh, there was a window there. He's got to throw that ball while the pressure's coming in on him. And he's there's a split second decision there where it's yeah. like, do I take this sack? Do I try to get out of here? 
Do I release the football? Um, maybe in a tight window. How, how fine is that line between <laughs> yeah. am, I, am I supposed to get rid of this thing or not, man? Do you? It's, uh, I mean, you're right there is the reason why quarterbacks get all the attention and all the love and all the hate and all the blame. And they make multi millions of dollars in the NFL for that reason. I mean, it's hard as a quarterback, you have to have a short memory while you're playing out there. I would say that jamming it in tight windows more times than not, you you're not going to get balls intercepted when you're trying to fit it in a tight hole Mm -hmm. Um, where, where you get, where you, you see a lot of interceptions is where quarterbacks are kind of locked in to a side of the field or to a certain one specific read. And they're like, okay, I'm going to throw it. I'm going to throw, I'm going to throw this dig. I think the linebacker is going to come, come down on this spot route. I'm going to throw the dig behind them. And it's kind of tight and you go, Oh, well, I'm just going to throw it anyway. Um, and then the guy that who's not even technically in the picture will come across the field and intercept it because you're staring over at that side of the field mm-hmm. um, versus just trying to, you know, throw it between two guys, you know, stuff like that. Typically it, it doesn't get intercepted. You know, if you want to talk about Colin Hill's got two interceptions this year that I, I can remember. Is that correct? Uh, Tennessee, the Tennessee one. I want to say there's three, but I, I don't know how many of them are actually on him, and I can't find the third one in my head right now. Yeah. Obviously, well, the Tennessee for, and, and the LSU one are the two big ones, everybody. No, yeah, there, there was one, a tip ball against Auburn, uh, slant route uh, yep. to the carry-on that gets tipped as well. Yeah, so you look at his interceptions this year, and none of them were bad decisions. None of them were like he was trying to throw the ball in traffic. The one ball against Tennessee got tipped at the line and the receiver tipped it up. Mm -hmm. Then uh, the Auburn one, yeah, I remember now, he was throwing the carry on joiner on a little dig route. Guy made a great break on the ball, hit it up in the air, pick. And then this one last week was receivers supposed to keep on working towards the quarterback and doesn't, right? And then stops his route. Well, you can't, I mean, yeah, I guess the quarterback shouldn't have thrown it, but the receiver, you can't stop your route. When you're running, you got to run. You can't just do that. You leave the quarterback out to dry. Um, so I, I wouldn't go in, in all of that being said is that he's efficient. I think he's smart with the football. He's not the most fleet of foot. And I think we've all seen that, that, you know, he asking him to get in and out of, of, of the pocket and run around and make plays. He's not going to do that. Um, but he, he does, in, in my opinion, he does take good care of the ball. The decisions he makes aren't like boneheaded plays. Um, they've just, un, unfortunately, he's just been unlucky, you know, on some things. But um, I think that with today's world, and I was talking to somebody about this this morning, is that this is how South Carolina has been as long as I've been following them since 2011. Anytime there's a new recruit, or a new player, or a new something, our fans make these guys out to be like they are going to come in and save the program. Well, the only person that I've ever, that I've even seen that has come in and quote unquote saved the program or has come in and and has played out to the hype that they had, I guess you would say, you know, probably Lattimore and Mm -hmm. Jadavian Clowney and some of those guys. You know, you look at Connor Shaw, but Connor didn't come in this big heralded guy that was going to save the program, right? Um, a lot of the quarterbacks that have come in to save the day have not saved the day, you know? Um, and so all that being said is that, you know, Colin Hill is a really good football player. He, he does a lot of good things, and I love watching him play the position. I think he plays it the right way. Um, but – He's a guy he, – he's a point guard back there because he's not a dual threat. He needs playmakers around him to help him. Um, mm-hmm. And right now, the reality is we just don't have – we don't have guys that are going to go out and change the scope of a game besides maybe Shy Smith. But, you know, a 5'10", 5'11", slot receiver, those, those are hard those, – it's hard to take over a game because now people know that they're keying on you. Well, um, it, it, it's – you know, it can be challenging. You know, I think moving forward, man, um, bringing along Jalen Brooks, uh, trying to maybe get some of these freshman receivers uh, ready or more comfortable out there. Um, 
and, and even some of the other tight ends, man, I think getting them involved a little bit. We saw it a little bit with Mullins. Um, they, they've got to find some more weapons for him to distribute the ball to. But, what uh, you know, final five games, obviously you're kind of at a point, like you said, it's gone for the most part record-wise the way everybody expected. So uh, the season could still turn around and be a really good year or it, you yeah. know, it could go the way some fans are worried about right now. And um, it's all going to depend on how it actually plays out on the field, man. So what what are your keys – Moving forward, um, you know, you can go offense, you can go big picture. I mean, obviously, I think we all know the run defense has got to pick up. On, yeah, on I mean, that, that's, the that's, the, that's the story of the, of the season. If, if we can't play better defense, I mean, we played okay against Auburn. Bo Nix was horrible. Call mm-hmm. it for what it is. I mean, I, I, and for the life of me, I cannot figure out why he wanted to keep throwing the ball at J.C. Horn. I, I, I don't know. I, I just – was baffling they're obviously not very good on offense um but you look at the florida game and you know we played okay against tennessee you know offensively we really or defensively we only really gave up 24 points um and in the lsu game we just we haven't we haven't had that defensive play because we're not here's the deal is like we're not going to go in game in game out scoring 35 38 points a game we are probably a 27 28 points a game team which should be good enough to win ball games, but that hasn't been. You know, in our losses, all of the all of the scores have been the other team has scored over thirty points. Yeah. Um, now, granted, the the Tennessee game they got over thirty on the pick six, and that's the other thing is when we turn the ball over, it can't be for touchdowns. You know, the the interception, and it, it's just unfortunate the way it's played out. And I don't think I've seen. I don't think I've seen in through five games somebody have two interceptions for a touchdown like that, especially ways that they've they've happened. Um, but offensively, we we stick we we can't fall behind because when we're ahead and we stick to our game plan and we run the football, you look at the Auburn game as a great example of that, or the Vanderbilt game, right? A little slow, sluggish, boring start. Then those holes start breaking. Now we're breaking eighty yard runs. You know, be able to do reverses off of it. So defense we're we're a defensive team or a defensive program we, we've got to go out and play better on the defensive side of the ball you look at the last five games three of which are very 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 winnable games mm-hmm. Missouri Kentucky and Ole Miss those games I mean and now you're looking at those three games and at the worst you know on an optimistic side you're at five and five if you lose to A&M and Georgia but here's the thing is Texas A&M and Georgia are winnable games too. So everything is still in front of you. I think that they've shown halfway through the year that they can play really well. They've also shown that, that there can be some issues, but all in all um, to give you a summary, I, I, I just, we, we, we still look, we're better on offense defensively. We don't really look a whole lot different than we have. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's why I'm, I'm. If I had to guess, I would love to win out and go five and zero oh these back half. But if I had to guess, I'd say three and two. Um, I think getting, um, getting to th- to three wins on these last five would be good for our program. Um, I think considering because we do have a lot of good young players, a lot of the kids are going to want to come back, except for probably J.C. Horn. Um, and you got a good foundation for for next year. And I think that you could really quiet the fan base going five and five, you know, cause I know it's average and nobody wants to be 500 every year, but it's better than four and eight. Right. Um, and it's better than how we have played. So um, the, 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 the end of the season could go really well. And, and it, it also unfortunately could go really bad. Yeah, and, I, and I, I mean, I think you sort of have to change the expectations when you're talking about all sec games too, you know, it's like, a five and five all SEC slate without maybe having a couple of those gimmies you would have any other year is sort of more like maybe a seven and five or or an eight and four type year, I think. And and like you said, man, you just, for them, they've got to erase some of the bad thoughts from last year and have something to build off of, have something to recruit to. And then you develop young players and, and hope you can build off of it for next year, I think. Yeah, because here's the thing is if you go out and you win two of these last three and you go four and six, four and six, in my opinion, um, is the equivalent to a six and six year 
because you're going to have two gimme games, right? And then, you know, two other con- – you know, you take Clemson and I don't know how Clemson got so good, you know, but they're, they're on a different planet right now. And you hate to be like, oh, well, we lose to Clemson. But, you know, from a football talking standpoint, yeah, yeah. You, you, you're at six and six. Um, and then you have uh, – we get five and five. Like you said, I think that's a seven and five because you give, give them – give me some two, two gimme games. Um, that's why five and five would be, would be really, really good. You break 500 and get six and four. Now you're, you're starting to feel pretty good about yourself. Cause that means you would have beaten Georgia or Texas A&M and mm-hmm. both games where you're not really supposed to win. Um, but you came out on top. That'd be, uh, those would be good. So here's the thing is that if I'm, if I'm coach Muschamp or I'm, still playing and I'm in that locker room. We have everything right in front of us. I mean, you, you, they watch the, t- the the same games that we do. The Georgia's not as crazy good as we thought. Their defense is awesome, but their offense is okay, you know, nothing mm-hmm. special. Um, and Texas A&M, I think, is a very winnable game as well. So it's all there. Um, I, I'm, I'm encouraged, and I think that there has been progress from last year. Um, but – yeah, it'll, it'll be a good finish for sure. I'm just glad there's football, you know? Yeah, oh, you and me both, man. At least we're able to have these conversations because there was a time there for a minute where I was like, I, you know, the Big Ten cancels and you're like, the dominoes have started. So, yeah, we all get ball. We all get – the fact that we're all able to even argue about a quarterback situation is really yeah. honestly a, a blessing. So, we're all happy about yeah. that. Very great stuff as always, man. Um, hey, let's do it again sometime, okay? Absolutely. Appreciate it, bro. All right, man. That's former Gamecock Perry Orth. Check him out. It's Is it at Perry Orth 10 on Twitter? That's right. Yep. And uh, search for QB1. Um, lots of great stuff going on there. Uh, we will do it again. We'll see you later, Perry. Thanks, man. Obviously, Perry Orth um, talking a little ball with us. And we're way over on the show now. But, uh, Chris, any – Final thoughts there on, on what Perry had to say, man. No, good stuff again from Perry. You know, as I said earlier, I, I really like hearing a quarterback's perspective. It's just a little different. I feel like they think a little bit differently because they take such a big picture view to offense and defense, you know. So, obviously, lots of questions to answer. Second half of the season, Perry, you know, laid out a bunch of those and how he sees some of the things going. So, it's going to be a very interesting back half of the season, you know, one way or another. And, and thought he had some great uh, observations on, on what we've seen so far and where it could go from here. Yeah. And again, I will, I'll post the full, um, the full interview on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash Gamecock central. There was one post I wanted to sort of address that I can't say I completely agree with, but let's see, where'd you go? RJ, RJ lane, one of our loyal followers on here. Um, given says given the talent on this team, there's no reason we don't go at least six and four. Comes down to the right in game decisions and utilizing all the talent we have. And I, I don't know if I can look uh, objectively and say that that is the expectation because I I think the the pro the problem is yet yeah, yes South Carolina does have talent and there is a good portion of this final schedule that that is very winnable but also if you really dove in if we all followed a lot of these programs as closely as we follow South Carolina their fan bases are saying the same thing there's some talent on this team why can't they win you know so is there is there more talent on South Carolina's team than there is on LSU's team right no I don't think you can make that argument. Texas A&M, um, is there more proven talent for South Carolina than there is for Texas A&M? I would say probably not. And, you know, now is is there more talent for South Carolina than potentially a Missouri or a Kentucky? I would say it, it's – I would say yeah, I think, but I would also say it's probably more comparable than anybody on the South Carolina side is wanting to admit. So then you sort of get to – I look at games like this for me. If they they played 10 times, how many – 
how many times would one team win or the other? And then all the crazy variables that can happen within a game. So if you played a team 10 times and it was a complete coin flip, then all the stupid little things that can happen in a football game are going to determine who wins that game. If you play Georgia 10 times and Georgia wins eight of the 10, then Georgia go, Georgia can probably make some stupid mistakes. They can have some – they can have a pick six. They can have a kickoff return for touchdown allowed even and, and still win the game. Mm-hmm. Now, what, what we saw last year is when you have a pick six, you're not able to run the football the way you normally are. You have three turnovers to one guy on the other team. You start adding up all those things then you, you can lose the game. It still came down to a Georgia missed field goal in OT for that to even happen. Yeah. So if 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 George if the same Georgia and South Carolina team played each other ten times, how you know how many would would Georgia have won last year? It, the answer may still be eight, but South Carolina did enough to be one of those two times. If you squared them off, I think the question is for like a a Kentucky or a Missouri or an Ole Miss, where where does that – how close are the numbers? You know, if they played 10 times, would South Carolina beat Ole Miss six out of the 10? I, I, I don't know. I'm just saying, even if you agree with that, there's still a ton of what I would call um, – like the margin for error there is still kind of um, kind of small. Yeah, and, and that's where – that's where you got to get, you know, when you're when you're getting in more close games and then you win them. And, it, and honestly, it doesn't matter how, you know. Like, it doesn't matter if you want to get, you know, yes, turnovers are very unreliable. You can't go into a game and say, well, if we just would have gotten three turnovers, we wouldn't want. That's the case in a lot of games, right? If, it's, if, if you are in the same stratosphere as a team and you win the turnover margin by three, you're going to win a lot more than you lose. But – However you get there, you know, whether your um whether your schedule's a little bit easier that year, whether the other team has a guy out or a bunch of key guys out, whether they turn the ball over to you, you need some of those things that happen a bunch, and then you have to build on them from there, right? And so and that's one thing we saw last year. South Carolina won that game against Georgia. Was it fluky? Prop yeah, it was Georgia's a better football team than South Carolina, but not that day. We also can't sit here and say, well, it doesn't count. They won. They, South Carolina had plenty of chances to make their own mistakes, and they didn't. So they get credit for winning that game, but they didn't go capitalize, you know. So they don't get credit for, you know, making something more of that game, using it as a springboard. So you got to stack some games, however you get there, and then you got to stack some seasons, and then you got to stack some recruiting classes, and and that's the predicament that they're finding themselves in now. Yep, no doubt. Um, all right, y'all. I think that's going to do it for today. Um, shout out to Chris Banks on Facebook. I think that might be a new name I've seen joining us all the way out from San Diego. Um, I don't know many, I know one person on the planet that lives in San Diego. So don't know many other people out that way. So I, I appreciate you joining us and I appreciate everybody joining us. Um, we may be on at a little bit different time tomorrow. I don't know. We'll post it on Twitter or we may, um, Chris, we may just record it if you want in the morning and then we can still pop it um, in the afternoon potentially. And um, then we'll, we'll hop back on. Obviously, next week um, we'll be talking Texas A&M. We'll have a, a guest to talk about uh, you know, their program, what they've done. I think they've, they've got Arkansas on Saturday, I believe. Yeah. So I'll be able to tune in and luckily be able to watch that game Saturday and actually focus on it a little bit and maybe have uh, some thoughts on those guys for you on Monday. So, all right, y'all. We'll talk soon. Enjoyed all the discussion. We appreciate uh, Eric Kemry. Appreciate Perry Orth. Good insight, as always. Uh, Love to hear from QBs, like you said, man. Um, So, we will see y'all very, very soon. See y'all.